Has the Bible been changed over time? Have we misquoted Jesus? What's with all these textual footnotes in the Bible? And hey, what's with all the missing verses? Can the publishers not count? These are all great questions that everyone has at some point in time, and I hope to answer all of these questions for you in the next few videos in this series. But before I do that, we're going to have to delve into the study called Textual Criticism. So why is this so important? Because the Bible is under attack today like never before. Tons of critical scholars are causing Christians to doubt their text. And unfortunately, most Christians in my experience have not taken the time to really work through these issues. And it may be the Christians do not even know where to get the answers from, and they may not even know how to obtain the tools to even dialogue with critics of the Bible. I hope in these videos to give Christians just enough information to be able to have confidence in their text that what they are reading was originally what was written, and also to be able to dialogue with critics and to be able to defend the Bible with confidence. So to begin, let us start with a working definition of what textual criticism is. So what is textual criticism? Textual criticism is the technique of restoring text as nearly as possible to their original form. The goal is to find the original wording of a document. In our case, it's an ancient document. So why do we need to do it? And in order to answer these questions, I'm going to need to explain to you where you got your Bible from. So this is my English Standard Version of the Bible that I've had for a few years. For a lot of Christians, they just sort of assume that the text just kind of floated down from heaven in this already one completed work, leather bound, indexed with a ribbon in the middle. That's not the way the Bible came down to us. It has a history just like any other ancient text. So let's start from the beginning. So around 33 AD, Jesus Christ is put to death on a cross, is buried in the tomb, and three days rises again only to ascend into heaven. So between the years of 33 AD to about 96 AD, the New Testament is produced by nine of Jesus' followers in 27 books that we now call the New Testament. Now, these documents that left the author's hand would be considered the originals. Now guys, one thing to keep in mind is that they were not all penned in the same area. And likewise, they didn't all end up in the same area. Many of the books of the New Testament were penned in one area and then mailed to another area. Let me give you a quick illustration using the epistles of Paul. So guys, here's how it worked out. Starting with the book of Romans, it's believed to have been written from the city of Corinth and then sent to the church in Rome. The book of 1 Corinthians was believed to have been written in the city of Ephesus and then sent to Corinth. 2 Corinthians was penned in Macedonia and then sent to Corinth again. The book of Galatians is believed to have been penned down in Paul's home church in Antioch and then sent to Galatia. Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians is believed to have been written in Rome and then sent to their respective cities, along with the book of Philemon, which also went to Colossae. The books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were likely to have been penned down in Corinth and then sent to Thessalonica. The books of 1st and 2nd Timothy were likely penned down in Rome and then sent to Timothy, who was pastoring in Ephesus. And finally, the book of Titus was probably penned down in Rome too, and then sent to Crete, where Titus was pastoring. So you see, even with just Paul's epistles, we're seeing the letters travel across the ancient world. Keep in mind that the book of 1 Peter was sent to a multitude of churches, as well as the book of Revelation. And a lot of these books just went everywhere. Anywhere they could go, Christians took the books with them, copied them as they were able, and wanted to get them out as much as possible. And so these documents were traveling all over the ancient world, and anyone who wanted a copy had to copy it by hand because there was no movable type printing press or copy machines or anything of the sort. So if you wanted a copy of one of Paul's epistles, you had to buy the materials yourself and copy it down by hand yourself. Or you could pay a professional scribe to do it for you, but that was rare. The Christians were mostly poor. And so for about 1500 years, this was just the reality. This was the way the New Testament was preserved. And while these New Testament documents were traveling all over the ancient world, they were getting lost in the sands of Egypt or being stored away in libraries, only to be found hundreds of years later by textual scholars. And so what textual scholars will do is that they keep finding these ancient manuscripts of the Bible and they document what the manuscript says. And they compile them and see what all the information is saying, where the differences are, where they agree, where they don't agree. So what they've done is they've taken all these manuscripts that they find and they take all the information that they say and they group them together and that's where textual criticism takes place. 
The end product is a Greek text of what the scholars consider to be the original, based on all the information that they have been given. Okay, so there's a few different Greek texts that have gone through this process. One of them is the Nestle Island Greek text, the UBS text, and if you're a King James onlyist or a new King James guy, the Texas Receptus will be your text, and we'll talk about that in another video. Okay, so what happens next is that the publisher who wants to put out an English Bible will get a hold of this Greek text, and they're all available in the stores, anyone can get one, but they'll take the Greek text, they'll take their scholars that they've hired who are experts in Biblical Greek, who are experts in English, and they'll do the laborious work of translating that Greek text into English. They'll then take that English text, they'll give it a leather binding, put a ribbon in it, and they'll sell it in stores, and that's how you got your Bible. So take pride. You have a document in your hands that has a very rich textual history, and every Christian ought to know it and be proud of it. And so here's why textual criticism is important. Because all of those manuscripts that were buried in the sands of Egypt or were stored in libraries and they were all compiled, they all disagree. All of the manuscripts do not line up with each other 100%. There are errors, there are copious mistakes, there are misspellings, there are verses that were left out for some reason, there were verses that were added for some reason. And so the science of textual criticism is trying to weed out those errors to try to reproduce what was originally written. And this is unfortunately what we have to do because the originals are all gone. They disintegrated hundreds of years ago. And so if we had the originals, then textual criticism would not be necessary because we would already have the original and thus just translate that and reproduce that. On the contrary, if all of the manuscripts were identical and said the same thing, then textual criticism would not be possible because then we have nothing to compare and contrast to. And so as it is in the wisdom of God, he has decided to leave us in the situation we currently find ourselves in, which is a long history of an unhindered, free textual transmission that the unfortunate byproduct of that is textual variation. Now there's a lot of wisdom in this particular form of textual transmission that we have a lot to be thankful for, and I'll go into that in another video. But for now, let me just leave you with this. My hope is to answer some of the most pressing questions that you will have about the text, such as some of those missing verses, those textual notes that seem to bother you every time you read them, answering objections that you may hear from an unbelieving critic. I hope to get to all those soon, but if there's something that you're particularly struggling with as it regards to the text and the history of the transmission, feel free to leave some comments below and just describe what it is you would like to see a video on. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it helpful and insightful, I would ask that you would just subscribe to my channel and share the video. I'm Eric from Think Easy. Thank you for watching this video.